Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you all to uh, another session on the tafsir of Surah Ar-Rum Alhamdulillah we reached uh, verse uh, number 37 and inshallah we'll pick up our conversation from there and we'll examine uh, uh, this verse and some of the verses uh, that follow it Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَبْسُطُ الرِّزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَقْدِرُ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ Have you not considered that God outspreads and constrains sustenance for whomsoever he wills? Truly in that are signs for a people who believe. In the verses that, uh, that we examined and discussed in our last sessions, we spoke at length about the signs of God's control and his power and his existence. And we mentioned that there are external signs of Allah's power and his presence, as well as internal signs. And we spoke about the fitrah as being a sign of God, a sign of his existence and also a sign of his power because it is in the primordial nature of man, of the human being to seek that transcendent power in times of adversity and, uh, and despair. So we see that in times of peril and adversity, we have this natural inclination towards God. And this is one of the internal indicators of his supreme power and uh, his existence. Now, another example is mentioned in ayah number 37. The idea that, that there is a supreme power that is in control over all things. So Allah says, he gives us the example of rizq, that have you not considered that God outspreads and constrains sustenance for whomsoever he wills? The distribution of rizq is mentioned here as one of the signs of God's power and his full control. Many of us, brothers and sisters, have seen people in our lives who, for example, are not the most business savvy, yet somehow they are, they're, they're given, they come across a great amount of rizq. And then you find someone who is business savvy, who has all of the resources, who is intelligent, but they are deprived of, uh, of sustenance. And this shows you, brothers and sisters, that yes, generally speaking, people that, that work hard, they're going to be better off than people who don't, assuming that we live in a, in a just society. But we have many examples of people who, who are given a lot of sustenance. They're, they're given a great deal of sustenance, even though... To us, it's inexplainable. So, for example, I remember many, many years ago, I met, uh, I met a gentleman who was illiterate, who couldn't read, couldn't write, but was a multimillionaire. Wealth just came to him very easily. And then you have someone else who goes to, to business school, who works day and night, and is not able to, to procure the same, uh, same amount of sustenance. Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have you not considered that God outspreads and constrains, constrains sustenance for whomsoever he wills? So one of the indicators that it's not just about human effort, that there is the hand of God, there is a, a power, a hidden power that apportions, that determines sustenance. We have a, a, a beautiful statement 
from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Nahjul Balagha, where he speaks about the apportioning of sustenance. He says in Sermon 91 of Nahjul Balagha, وَقَدَّرَ الْأَرْزَاقَ فَكَثَّرَهَا وَقَلَّلَهَا He has apportioned sustenance. And it is he who increases it and decreases it. That ultimately these things are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَسَّمَهَا عَلَى الضِّيقِ وَالسَّعَةِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he spreads this riz. Sometimes he gives, he gives more to those who are prosperous and sometimes he gives, he gives less to those who have very little. فَعَدَلَ فِيهَا لِيَبْتَلِيَ مَنْ أَرَادٍ And Allah is just in the way that He apportions sustenance. He doesn't give everyone equal sustenance. He distributes it on the basis of His justice. Because He wants to try us. We were created to be tried. We were created to be put through certain tribulations, certain difficulties, certain circumstances that would contribute to the maturation of our souls. Allah, sometimes He tries us with ease, with prosperity, and sometimes He tries us with hardship. So again, Amir al muminin here, He mentions that that ease and prosperity is also a type of ibtila. It's a type of trial. In the same way that, that poverty and financial difficulties are a trial, wealth and ease and comfort is, is, is a trial. And Allah tries the wealthy to see the extent of their gratitude. And he tries those who are poor to, to see the extent of their patience. And I've mentioned this before, brothers and sisters, that you know many of us, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our material wealth. But believe me, brothers and sisters, in many cases, if Allah were to answer this dua favorably, it would lead to our spiritual destruction because the trial of wealth is a very difficult trial to, uh, it's a very difficult trial to succeed on, to, to be successful. So there is the, the trial of, uh, of wealth and the trial of poverty. Now, ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who expands our sustenance and he's the one who constricts it. Now, when we think about rizq, many people have questions about sustenance. From an Islamic perspective, there is a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen where he speaks about sustenance. And he says that إِنَّ الرِّزْقَ رزقان, That we have two types of sustenance. And the verse here seems to be speaking about a certain type of rizq that has the, that has the capacity that, that we essentially play a role in determining. So Anir al-Mu'mineen, he says, إِنَّ الرِّزْقَ رزقان, That there are two types of sustenance. Rizqun tatlubuhu. There is a sustenance that you must seek. Warizqun yatlubuk. And there is a type of sustenance that seeks you. So, a very simple example the sustenance that you seek is that sustenance that is conditional, that is conditioned on you getting a job. You know, you performing well and excelling at your work. That's a conditional type of rizq. But then you have sustenance that seeks you, that you didn't have to put any effort in. It, it's, it has been apportioned for you. 
It has been decreed to reach you. It seeks you. So if you think about the sustenance that a fetus receives in the womb of the mother, that's the sustenance that seeks the creature. It's not a type of rizq that, that the creature had to seek. And this continues throughout our lives. We have a type of sustenance that we have to seek, that we have to labor to procure. And then we have sustenance that seeks us. So the sustenance that we have to seek, the rizq that we have to seek is the example that I gave with, you know, getting a job and working. And then sometimes you, you receive sustenance in the form of inheritance. You might have, for example, an uncle that passed away and you're the only, you know, uh, you're the nearest of kin, you're the only living uh, relative. And that is sustenance that comes to you. Now, when it comes to that, you know, and this is what the Prophet means when he says, لَوْ أَنَّ بْنَ آدَمْ فَرَّ مِنْ رِزْقِهِ كَمَا يَفِرُّ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ لَأَدْرَكَهُ كَمَا يُدْرِكُهُ الْمَوْتِ So the Prophet, he says, if the son of Adam, if a person were to flee from his sustenance in the same way that he flees from death, that sustenance will catch, catch up to him in the same way that death catches up with a person. So here, the Prophet is speaking about that, that second type of rizq, the rizq that seeks us, that seeks you and I. Now when the verse says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَبْسُطُ الرِّزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَقْدِرُ That have you not considered that God outspreads and constrains sustenance for whomsoever he wills? We understand from this verse that it's that the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala apportions sustenance is is, is related in many ways to our own conduct, meaning that we play a role in the amount, to a certain degree, we play a role in the amount of sustenance that we receive and the amount of sustenance that we are deprived of. So there is that has been apportioned, just like the hadith that the Prophet mentioned, that it's like death. Even if you run away from it, it's going to seek you. It's going to reach you. Now, the verse doesn't seem to be speaking about that, that predetermined rizq. But rather, we find that it seems that the verse is referring to that type of rizq that, that we, have, we play a role in, uh, in acquiring. Now, I'll share with you some ahadith that speak about the actions that elicit, that attract rizq. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a system. There are, certain, there are spiritual laws that determine the, the outspreading of sustenance and the constriction of sustenance. So for example, we have a, a hadith we have many ahadith that speak about the, the action of charity and how much of an impact it has on the increasing of sustenance. We have a hadith that specifically speaks about feeding people. So there's a hadith from the Prophet where he says, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, sustenance is quicker, it, it goes quicker, it is, it is given more quickly to a person who feeds others. So a person who feeds other people, you give food to them. It will reach that rizq will reach that person faster than a knife cutting through meat, through flesh. So you can imagine a sharp knife 
how quickly it cuts through meat. The Prophet says the one who feeds people. And, and the hadith doesn't say that they have to necessarily be poor people. Just the act of feeding people has that, uh, has that effect, that it attracts riz. Now, of course, charity in general, and of course, it's always better to give charity to the needy, to give sadaqah to the needy. But even if, even if someone is not poor, from a fiqhi standpoint, it, it's still, it would still be permissible to, to give them. Now, the Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, for example, he says, istanzilu rizqa bil-sadaqa, that bring down, bring down sustenance through charity. You know, that's why, brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes if we're having financial problems, you know, when you, if you speak to a financial advisor, what are they going to tell you? If you're having financial problems, they'll tell you, maybe you need to think about getting another job. You need, you need to go into saving mode. They'll tell you, maybe contact all of your friends and your family members. Tell them that there's no more restaurants, no more gifts. You save every dime. This is if you have a secular, non-Islamic worldview. But because of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, we understand that there are, there are spiritual laws. There's a spiritual dynamic that has to be taken into consideration. And that is to give charity. Now, you may think it's counterproductive. I'm poor. Why are you telling me to give? I should receive charity. Imam al-Sadiq says, no. If you are afflicted with poverty, do business with Allah by giving charity. Now, and you give according to your, your ability. So, so feeding people, charity. There are many ahadith about the virtue of giving charity and how that plays a role in increasing one's sustenance. There is a, a narration from the Prophet Sallallahu where he speaks about being in a state of wudu, being in a state of tahara as much as you can, has, plays a role in increasing someone's rizq. So getting into the habit, you know, whenever you go to the washroom or you go to the bathroom, you know, when you finish, you're washing your hands, do a little, it takes 20 seconds maximum, 30 seconds. Practicing these things, and inshallah, you'll see the, the you know, obviously the spiritual benefit as well as the worldly benefit. Another thing that's mentioned in the ahadith regarding the actions that increase one's sustenance is a tradition from Imam al Baqir where he says, Alayka bid dua. Imam al-Baqir he says, make dua, pray, supplicate for your brothers and your sisters in secret. When you're praying alone, mention them in your dua. When you, if you pray Salatul Layl, mention them in your dua. Pray for your brothers and sisters. So instead of backbiting behind people behind their back, Make dua behind people's back. This will benefit your dunya and your akhirah. So the, the, really the only thing that we should be doing behind people's back is that we should make dua for them. We should ask Allah to, to bless them, to put barakah in their lives, to guide them, to, to remove the afflictions from them. So when you pray for others, you are, you are, the, benefic you are the beneficiary. So Imam al-Baqir, he says, one of the things that attracts riz, one of the things that attracts sustenance is to pray for people in secret, to pray for your brothers and sisters in faith in secret. Other ahadith mention husnul khuluq, being kind, being courteous to, to, to people in general, to your family, plays a, uh, plays a role in increasing one's sustenance. Now, when it comes to the actions that constrict our riz, there are many ahadith that are mentioned. 
One of them is a hadith from the Prophet وآله, where he says, Man an muslimu min haq, rizq illa You know, depriving a fellow Muslim of their right. You know, for example, you, you borrow money from them or you have an amana and you haven't given it back to them or, and you're oppressing them essentially. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deprive you of sustenance. He will deprive you of, uh, of riz. And one more hadith from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. He says, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَيُذْنِبُ الذَّنْبِ فَيُزْوَى عَنْهُ الرِّزْقِ You know, sometimes there was sustenance that was on its way to you, meaning that you were going to receive a type of rizq, but you committed a sin and you repelled it. You know, only Allah knows how much barakah we've missed out on in our lives, how much spiritual rizq, how much material rizq we've been deprived of because of our sins. You know, that's why Prophet Nuh alayhi salam he says, he says, رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا Nuh alayhi salam would tell us community, repent to Allah. يُرْسِلُ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا That Allah will send down rain. وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ That he will, he, will, uh, he, will, he will grant you children and He will increase your wealth. So a lot of the, the suffering that we experience, uh, the deprivation that we see in our lives, a lot of it is connected to our own iniquities. Now, of course, this is not to deny that, that there are people who, who take the rights of others, but there's no doubt that our own actions, our own sins repel and they, they prevent us, they prevent uh, sustenance from reaching us. Now, again, just going back to the, uh, the verse from Surah al rum أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَبْسُطُ الرِّزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَقْدِرُ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ Now, again, the, the takeaway message, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of our discussion, is that one of the signs of Allah's power is that He decides. It's ultimately up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is going to receive an increase in sustenance and who is going to receive a decrease? And, and we mentioned that, that in many cases, it's not related to intelligence. There are some people who are less business savvy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he opens up the floodgates for them. There are others that are, that are, are, are brilliant, who have, you know, they have more degrees than a, ther than a thermometer, as they say. And they're, 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 living, they're living very humble lives. They're not, they don't have access to the rizq that others do. The point being is that this is another sign, it's another indicator that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in full control, that there is, there is a hidden power behind the chains of causes and effects, behind the visible world that apportions sustenance. And this is why Amir al-Mu'mineen in Nahjul Balaghi, he says, عَرَفْتُ اللَّهَ بِفَسْخِ الْعَزَائِمِ that Amir al muminin he says, I came to know God when, when, when plans fell apart. You know, sometimes you're determined to do something. You have all of the resources. You think that you have everything under control and then the plan falls apart. You're 100% sure that you got the job, you, you signed the contract, and then it all falls apart. And Ira al muminin he says that this Araftullah, that I came to realize that no matter how much you plan, no matter how much you think you're in control, things fall apart, subhanAllah. No matter how much you put in, how much effort you put in, Sometimes things fall apart, and this is a this is an indicator. This is an indication that that you're not in control. As much as you'd like to believe that you're in control, you're not. Sometimes you do your best, and it's out of your hands. 
I came to know the power of God by the, the failures, by the, the annulments of the things that I was determined to do. You know, we, we think that, you know, just because we have a contract, that that's it. It's final. Con- contracts are breached. Things, things just don't pan out the way that we expect. Who's, who's governing this universe? It's not us. And then in verse number 38, So give to your nearest of kin their right, as well as the needy and the traveler. That is best for those who desire or who seek the face of God, and it is they who will be the successful ones. So the previous verse spoke about the apportioning of sustenance. Now, when you are given riz, many people get, they develop this impression that it's my money whether they acquire it through hard work or the sustenance falls into their lap, people assume that my money is my money. I have a full right to it. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that the the riz, the sustenance that reaches you, whether it was sustenance that you had to seek or it was sustenance that sought you, There is a portion of your wealth that doesn't belong to you. So give to your nearest of kin their right. It's theirs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed their right in your possession. It's in your hands. But your your function is is to do what? Allah appointed you. And gave you the opportunity to deliver it. You are simply a vehicle that was meant to deliver that sustenance to that individual. So don't think, don't become deluded into thinking that this is my money and it belongs to me. The rights of others are are connected to your wealth. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you it does, you have to remember that it doesn't completely belong to you. That you have to look after. And what's mentioned here is what? Your nearest of kin. Salatul Rahim, brothers and sisters. You know, in addition to keeping in touch and checking up on our family members, our relatives, if we are able to financially help them. Now, of course, if we're talking about parents and children, that's, that's a religious obligation. If you have parents who are poor and you're able to provide for them, you are obligated to do so. It's wajib on you to to maintain them. If you have children who are financially going through difficulties, you as parents, if you are are able to, you are obligated to, uh, to provide for them. Now, when it comes to distant relatives, so for example, imagine you have a cousin who's poor. Is it wajib on you to take money from your wealth and give them? It's not wajib. But if you want to give charity, it's better to give to your nearest of kin than to give to a stranger. They have priority. So these are the, those who have priority, your nearest of kin, those who don't have enough to meet their basic needs, the masakin. Ibn Sabil. At that time, it was a big problem. People used to travel and they would be stranded because there were a lot of bandits. People would travel through the deserts. They would get raided and they would be, they would not have enough wealth to get back to their homes. So these are the three groups that are mentioned here that that have priority because they need that immediate uh, relief by virtue of being your nearest of kin or if they're masakim or if they're stranded travelers, that is 
best for those who desire the face of God. Now, what does it mean to say that that they that this is better for those who desire the face of God? Now, of course, we're not talking about a physical face. Allah is not a physical being, but desiring the face of God. You know, when you when you speak, if you want someone's full attention. You want them to direct their face to you. You know, a face-to-face -face conversation is the most intimate form of communication. It means that someone is giving you their undivided attention. If someone wants the intimate, the special attention of Allah, they want His special mercy, then they should look after. They should help their nearest of kin. They should give charity to them. They should give charity to the masakeen, and they should look after those people who are who are in desperate situations. So it's not just about the act, right? It's about doing it with the niyyah, with the intention of seeking that, that special mercy of Allah, seeking the face of God. So in the same way that, you know, the face is the primary identity of someone and we we communicate to people face to face when we want their undivided attention. If we want that special rahmah of Allah, that we have to be charitable towards our nearest of kin, the destitute, and you know the, those who are in the most desperate of situations, like that stranded travel. And it is they; these are the people who will be successful. Wa muflihun. They will be successful not just in Akhirah. They will be successful in dunya and in Akhirah. Because we mentioned, you know, some of the, you know, even some of the material benefits of giving charity. Now, this verse is also, of course, the Prophet is the primary addressee of this verse. Now, when the ayah says, فَآتِ ذَا الْقُرْبَى حَقًا so give your nearest of kin their right. Who is the Prophet's nearest of kin? It would be his, his daughter Fatima. And in fact, there is a, uh, there is a tradition from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri where he says, When this verse was revealed, When this verse was revealed, هذه الآية على النبي أعطى فاطمة فدكا وسلمها إليها. That when this verse was revealed, this was a command to the Prophet to give your nearest of kin their right. This verse was actualized when uh, when the Prophet conquered Khaybar. Abu Sa'id al Khudri he says that. The application of this verse in the Prophet's life was that he gave Fadak to Fatima and he, he basically gave it to her uh, during his, his life. Now, I want to share with you guys a, uh, a tradition because when you speak about this verse, فَآتِ ذَا الْقُرْبَ حَقَّ it's, uh, it's naturally going to bring up the discussion of Fadak and the oppression of, uh, of Lady Fatima alayhi salam. There is a, a conversation between, between Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and Abu Bakr that's mentioned. And this is mentioned by Shaykh al tabrasi in, uh, in Kitab al-Ihtijaj. And it's also mentioned, it's mentioned in many uh, sources. It's also, also mentioned in the commentary of Nahjul Balagha by uh, Ibn Abi al-Hadid al-Mu'tazili, the, the prominent Sunni Mu'tazili scholar who gave a commentary on Nahjul al -Balagha. And it's an interesting conversation. And it, it really shows you, it reveals the extent of the oppression against the Prophet's daughter. So I'll read the conversation and I'll, I'll explain it as I go along. So the narration says that when Abu Bakr confiscated uh, the orchards of Fadak, فَقَالَ Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr claimed, he said, هَذَا فَيْءُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ That this is 
the public property of Muslims. فَإِنْ أَقَامَتْ شُهُودًا أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ so, so Abu Bakr is saying this in front of Imam Ali alayhi salam that Fadak is the public, it's public land, it's public property, it's owned by all Muslims. فَإِنْ أَقَامَتْ شُهُودًا أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ جَعَلَهَا جَعَلَهُ لَهَا وَإِلَّا فَلَا حَقَّ لَهَا فِي So Abu Bakr, he says this. He says, Fadak is public property. It belongs to the Muslims. If Fatima alayhi salam can produce witnesses that the Prophet gave it to her, that he, that he bestowed it upon her, then let her do so. Uh, up, uh, until then, she has no right over it. This is what Abu Bakr says to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now look at the, the brilliant, the brilliant answer of Amir al-Mu'mineen. فَقَالَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ يَا أَبَا بَكْرِ أَتَحْكُمُ فِيْنَا بِخِلَافِ حُكْمِ اللَّهِ فِي الْمُسْلِمِينَ Oh, Abu Bakr, are you ruling in this case in a way that goes against the law of God with regard to Muslims? Abu Bakr said, no, I'm not ruling in a way that is contrary to divine law. Amir al-Mu'mineen, then he says to him, قَالَ فَإِنْ كَانَ فِي يَدِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ شَيْءٌ يَمْلِكُونَهُ ثُمَّ الدَّعَيْتُ أَنَا فِي مَنْ تَسْأَلُ الْبَيَّنَ Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says to Abu Bakr, if, if a Muslim had possession of something, and I came and I claimed that it belongs to me. Who would you ask for evidence? Abu Bakr says, If something was in the hand, was in possession of another Muslim, and you came along and said that it's mine, I'll ask you to produce evidence because you're the claimant. You know, in, in the West, they have this concept of possession is nine-tenths of the law. If someone possesses something, the assumption is what? The assumption is that they're the rightful owner, and anyone who challenges that needs to, needs to bring evidence. So Abu Bakr says, no, I would ask, I would ask you to bring evidence because it's not in your possession. Then Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, فَمَا بَالُ فَاطِمَ سَأَلْتَهَا الْبَيِّنَ عَلَى مَا فِي يَدِهَا Why is it that when it comes to Fatima, you are asking her to bring witnesses that she owns something that was in her possession? وَقَدْ مَلَكَتْهُ فِي حَيَاتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ And Fadak was not something that Fatima inherited after the Prophet. She owned it during the lifetime of the Prophet, and this is why I mentioned the statement of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. He says, That the Prophet gave Fadak to Fatima, and he gave her control of it. She had employees working on, on the land of Fadak. And she, she owned it during the lifetime of the Prophet and she exercised ownership even after the, uh, the death of the Prophet. Why didn't you ask the Muslims who claimed that it belongs to them, ask them for witnesses? Why are you asking the one who has possession of the land for witnesses? كَمَا سَأَلْتَنِي so why is it that now you're asking me for, you're asking me and Fatima to bring witnesses while if it was a different situation and we claimed that something that is in the possession of another Muslim belonged to us, you would, you would ask the claimant for, uh, for witnesses. فَسَكَتَ أَبُوبَكْ 
Abu Bakr became silent. Because again, it, this is a, this is a, it's a legal principle. Qa'idatul yad is a fiqhi principle. The, the maxim of possession. If you see someone, if you see something in some, someone's possession, you assume that it belongs to them until it is proven otherwise. And if anyone else claims to be the owner, the onus is on them to produce witnesses. The, the one who, who is in possession is not required to produce witnesses. Fasakata Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr became silent. Faqal Umar. Then Umar interjects. Ya Ali, da'ana min kalamik. Oh Ali, leave this talk. We're not able to debate you. Basically, we don't want to get into a debate. If you are able to produce, I mean, look at the, the statement here. Allah. If you are able to produce just righteous witnesses, if we can produce reliable witnesses, just witnesses, if you're not able to produce witnesses, then it is the property of the Muslims. So this shows you, this gives you a, a glimpse into the mazlumiyah of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. Now again, the, in the life of the Prophet, the application of this was the Prophet giving Fadak to Fatima, but as a general principle, it also refers to the importance of observing the rights of uh, the kin, and the rights that the poor and those who are in desperate situations have over us. Uh, I think we'll just cover one final verse. Then the, verse number 39. <laughs> That which you give in gifts to others in order that it may increase through other people's wealth does not increase with God. But that which you give in charity, seeking the face of God, it is they who shall have manifold increase. Now, what is the meaning of this verse? So the previous verse spoke about giving, you know, giving to your, your nearest of kin, giving to the poor, giving uh, to, to the stranded traveler. And then the, this verse speaks about a tendency that some of us have when it comes to giving in general. When we give, in many cases, we expect, there is this expectation that it's going to be reciprocated. Especially when it comes to gift giving. You know, if I, I give you a gift, and especially if it's someone who is wealthy, I give because I anticipate that the person is going to give me something better. Or there, there's, there's a, a type of benefit that I'm looking for. Now, it's it's very tempting to look at this verse and say, oh, the verse is speaking about usury, about riba. When you look at the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, you know, riba was prohibited later on. You know, we mentioned that this was a Meccan surah, the verses that explicitly ban usury, riba are mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is a Madani surah. So, some have considered this verse as, you know, an introduction to the banning of riba. But we have a tradition from Imam al-Sadiq salam where he says that riba here is referring to the halal usury, 
which means what? He says, huwa hadiyyatuka ila rajul. It is when you give a gift to someone. Tatlubu minhu thawab afdala minhuma. Fadhalika riban yu'kal. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, this refers to the act of giving a gift with the expectation that you will receive something better in return. Meaning you don't make it a condition. You just have this expectation to get something that is even better than what you gave. You know, you know for example, sometimes people, they give charity. You know, they might give you know, a substantial amount in charity or a gift, whatever it may be. But what they're getting is something even better. You know, they're getting good PR. They're getting a tax break. They're getting recognition. They're being recognized as a philanthropist in the community. So you, so you see there's this tendency that we don't give, we give with, with certain strings attached. There is this expectation. So... Imam al-Sadiq, he says, riba riba'an. There are two types of riba. There are two types of usury. Ahaduhuma halalun wal akharu haram. There is a permissible usury and there is prohibited usury. Fa'amma al-halal. As for the permissible usury, fahuwa an yaqruda rajulu akhahu qardhan. يريد أن يزيده ويعوضه أكثر أكثر بأكثر مما يأخذه بلا شرط بينهما. The halal type of riba is if you come to me and you need a loan, for example, say you need a thousand dollars as a loan, and I give you a thousand dollars, interest free. I have made no condition that. I expect you to give me more. I give you an interest-free loan. Qard Hassan, right? But in my heart, I have this hope that you're going to give me more than I lent you. That just to express your gratitude, you're going to give me $1,200 or $1,100. Meaning I didn't set it as a condition, but I, but I have this hope that I'm going to get more in return. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, فَإِنْ أَعْطَاهُ أَكْثَرُ مِمَّا أَخَذَهُ عَلَىٰ غَيْرِ شَرْطٍ بَيْنَهُمَا فَهُوَ مُبَاحٌ لَهُ Imam al-Sadiq says that if that person that took that interest-free loan without any condition for interest gave you more, so I give you a thousand, and just to show your gratitude, you give me 1200 back. I didn't ask you for it, but the twelve, the 200 is a gift. Imam al-Sadiq says, I can take the 1200. It is halal. That is a halal type of riba because there was no condition made for the interest. But, so there's no haram being committed, but Imam al-Sadiq says, وَلَيْسَ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ ثَوَابٍ but what happened there, you will get no reward from God. Because you gave it with the intention that I, I have a hope that I will get something more in return. So if someone gives that, that loan, that interest-free loan, but they do it because they do it with the intention that maybe I'll get something from that person. They're seeking that, that addition. They might not say it. They don't make it a condition. And nor are they going to create a ruckus about it if they don't get it. But there is that desire in their hearts. Imam al-Sadiq says, وَلَيْسَ, وليس لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ ثَوَابٌ فِيمَا أَقْرَضَهُ You sacrificed the reward that Allah would have given you. فهذ, so then the Imam says, وَأَمَّا الْحَرَامِ as for the haram usury, the haram riba, فَالرَّجُلُ يَقْرُضُ قَرْضًا وَيَشْتَرِطُ أَنْ يُرَدَّ أَكْثَرَ مِمَّا أَخَذَهُ فَهَذَا هُوَ الْحَرَامِ Now the haram, the usury that is forbidden is to give a loan with the condition that you return me 
I, I, that you have to give me 10% on the loan or 20% on the loan. Now this is haram, this is forbidden. But even the halal riba that Imam al-Sadiq mentions, he says that it's halal, you're not committing a sin, but you are missing out on the thawab. The thawab of doing it purely without any expectation from that person. And this is how we should give because the I, what does the ayah say? وَمَا آتَيْتُم مِّن رِبًا لِيَرْبُوَ فِي أَمْوَالِ النَّاسِ فَلَا يَرْبُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ that which you give in gifts to others in order that it may increase through other people's wealth does not increase with God. If you're looking for returns, the best person to do business with is Allah. And that's why Allah says, وَمَا آتَيْتُم مِّن زَكَاتٍ If you give something as charity with no expectation and you're doing it because you are seeking the face of Allah. You are seeking that, that, that special rahmah of Allah. Those are the ones who will get manifold increase. Those are the ones who will truly get a return. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies, it's beautiful that when you do business with Allah, if I told you now that if you give this person a loan, you double your money. Many of us would not even hesitate. You're guaranteed. If I if you give me, if I give you a if, if you give me a thousand, I'll give you two thousand back in a month. You would think this is the best business. You're doubling. You're getting twofold of your money. If I say, if you give me a, a $1,000 loan, I'll give you 5,000. Five-fold increase. That, is there any better deal than that? When you look at the Quran, when it comes to any good deed, what does Allah say? مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا when you do something purely for Allah, the bare minimum return is what? The bare minimum return is tenfold. Every single deed is multiplied ten times over. This is the minimum. Man ja'a bil hasana, man ja'a bil hasanati, falahu ashru anthaliha. As is mentioned in Surah Al An'am, Surah 6, ayah number 60. Now, when it comes to when it comes to charity, when it comes to especially when it comes to giving loans, you know, sometimes when people need money, we just we give them. But it's actually there's more thawab in giving a loan than giving than handing handing out money to people. There's a hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam where he says that. That it is written on the gates of paradise. That loans are multiplied 18 fold. And charity is multiplied 10 fold. So loaning money has more thawab than just giving money to people. Now, you may ask, why is that? Because when you give, if I just give you $1,000, you use it and you're done. But if I loan you $1,000 and you return it to me, I can use that same money to help others. So the capacity for good is greater when you give these, uh, these interest-free loans that multiple people can benefit from that loan. But if you just hand it out to someone, it's good. It's rewarding. Allah will give you a, a minimum tenfold return on that. But giving a qarv is, 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 uh, is more rewarding, has more barakah. So, so tenfold is the minimum when you do things purely for the sake of Allah. If it's a loan, 18fold. But then Allah increases it. You know, the amount of reward you, you receive is related to your ma'rifah, 
It's related to your sincerity. And I'll conclude with the, the famous ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah 261. The parable of those who spend their wealth in the way of God. You know, there are many people who spend their wealth. We have to underline it because many people don't give they give because they want to be praised or recognized but to do it without any expectation from anyone you only do it for Allah that's it and and it even if the person is ungrateful it doesn't discourage you because you're you're not your interaction your, your transaction is not even related to them. You're doing a transaction with Allah. What does Allah say? The parable of those who spend their wealth in the way of God. The parable of those who spend their wealth in the way of God is that of a grain that grows seven ears in every year a hundred grains so this ayah is saying what 700 fold 700 it's it's there's a 700 uh, manifold increase and then allah says wallahu yudha'ifu lim and allah increases it even more for whomsoever he wishes. So, my dear brothers and sisters, we should try our best to give sadaqah, to give charity as often as we can, especially when it comes to our relatives. We have relatives, uncles, aunts, cousins, nieces, nephews, a distant cousin. If you know that you have relatives that are poor, Either give them an, an interest-free loan, give them charity, whatever you whatever, whatever you see is fit. This has so many benefits. The thawab is astronomical. The benefits to your dunya, to your akhirah are immeasurable. And, and one final comment, because this is something that many people overlook. You know, it's not a coincidence that when someone passes away, you know, usually if there's a death in the community, what do people usually do on the night of the burial? There's an announcement, please, a request to do Salatul Wahsha. But when you go to the Hadith, we put so much emphasis on Salatul Wahsha, you know, the, the, uh, the prayer that we perform to remove the loneliness that the soul feels during the first night in the grave. We mention this, and that's good. But the hadith from the Prophet says, Irhamu mawtakum bisadaqa. Have mercy on your deceased by giving charity. If you are not able to give charity, then offer that two rak'ah prayer of Salatul Wahsha. There are many of us, we have family members who pass away, loved ones who pass away, community members who pass away. We perform Salatul Wahsha, but we don't give charity on their behalf. We're doing a disservice to us and a disservice to the mayyit. So inshallah, we revive this, this culture of, of sadaqah, this culture of, of doing, and especially sadaqah, giving charity in secret, doing it purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we can receive uh, the spiritual uh, rewards of this. Uh, we'll conclude with that. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد عجل فرجا Any questions or comments? Uh, Assalamualaikum. Alaikum as-salam.
could you please expand on the rights of uh, family and travelers? Does it extend to more than when they're just in financial need? Now, the, the context of the, of the verse, because the previous verse was speaking about Riz, it seems that it's speaking about the financial rights, just going off of the of the context. But uh, of course, in the Islamic tradition, the rights of uh, of the nearest of kin goes you know beyond the financial uh, the financial priority that they that they should receive. As I mentioned, if someone has a cousin, for example, who is who's poor. It's not wajib on me to, to financially help them. It's not, it's not an obligation on me, meaning I'm not committing haram. Uh, but it would be more rewarding if I were to help them as opposed to a complete stranger. So the context of the ayah that we're looking at is, uh, is speaking primarily about the financial uh, the financial rights of, uh, of the groups that are mentioned. And uh, another question about uh, destiny. Um, question is, since there are different acts that we can perform to change our destiny, and how does this uh, play with Allah's knowledge of what we will actually end up doing or not, and how does this not go against free will? So there's no change in Allah's knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his, his knowledge is not affected by our decisions. Now, when we say that we play a role in, in shaping our, our destiny, it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is waiting to see you know, what, what, what choices we're going to make. Because again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the, it's difficult to speak about Allah because he's outside of time and space. What is actually happening is that the knowledge of God is being revealed. So it's not that there's a change. So if someone, for example, gives, gives charity and... You know, they, their their ten years are added to their lives. Then it doesn't mean that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Obviously, I mean, I, I would imagine the questioner knows that it's not that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Okay, now, you know, because you did this, I'm adjusting what I uh, what I decreed." The knowledge of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is is fixed, but you know, in many cases. What's, what's being revealed, these things are being revealed, for example, to the mala'ika. They're, uh, they're being revealed uh, to us. So it's not that there's a change in divine knowledge. These actions are essentially revealing that, that fixed eternal knowledge of God. These are very complicated conversations to have because we're trying to understand a being who is outside of the was outside of time and space and therefore it's difficult for us to fathom how how he how he makes his final decree based off of the actions of a finite being that is confined by space and time but it doesn't uh that there's there's no change in Allah's decree a lot of these you know these ahadith are there to motivate us to uh, to do things that will ultimately reveal uh, Allah's Allah's knowledge of what we were going to do in the first place. Thank you. And there's a question asking: Could you um, explain a little bit about uh, fadak and of what what it is and the context around it? So <clears throat> the argument that so so fadak is basically a uh, it's an, it was it came under the control of the prophet. Uh, so after Khaybar was conquered, the Jewish tribes in Medina essentially surrendered uh, 
to the Prophet, and they basically gave this land to the Prophet. So this was not land that was acquired through war. It was basically given, it was a form of surrender. Now, in Islamic law, when, when Muslims conquer land through fighting, it is it belongs to the Muslims. You know, so one fifth of it belongs to Allah, the messenger of the Khums is taken out. And then uh, four fifths of it is distributed among the fighters. And it's the spoils of war. Now, Fedek was not acquired through fighting. It was it was surrendered to the Prophet. So therefore it belongs it's, it's 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 part of the Anfan. Meaning that it is it belongs to the uh, the prophet. So when the, so it belongs to the prophet, and then the ayah came, commanding the prophet to give it to Fatima. Now, why why did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam give it to Fatima? Is it just there's a reason why this happens? It's because the prophet knew that Ahlul Bayt alaihissalam would not be in control after his demise. The prophet knew this. And therefore, the Islam of Ahlul Bayt needed a way to sustain itself. So in the same way, in the same way that Khadija was the financial backer of the Prophet, the government was going to be usurped. And Fedek essentially was there to serve as a as a parallel power structure that would finance the Ahlul Bayt in order for them to continue propagating the message. And this is why Fedek was of interest to, uh, to the Khulafa. That's why, you know, uh, that's why Umar ibn al-Khattab advised Abu Bakr not to give it back. Because how are we gonna, how are we gonna, so how are we gonna fund the, the military expansions, meaning that the revenue that was being generated by FedEx was enough to, to serve as a military budget. So taking away FedEx from Fatima to Zara was essentially weakening, financially weakening the Ahlul Bayt. So the Prophet gave Fatima alayhi salam FedEx to be... Uh, to be a financial resource for the Ahlul Bayt because their rights would be deprived uh, uh, by the government. And in order to propagate Islam, you need uh, those resources. And, uh, and therefore the Khulafa, they saw that uh, they saw that this would weaken them uh, financially and therefore uh, they confiscated it. Thank you very much, Shaykh. I have a question. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. One more question. Yes. Alaykum, Shaykh. Alaykum, As-salamu In Ayah 38, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fa'ati dal qurba haqqahu wal miskina wabna sabil. So, wabna sabil are wayfarers or uh, what are they? Can you please uh, shed some light here, please? So, Webna Sabil, if you take it literally, it means the son of the path. Now, the son of the path, it means the, the one, the traveler, you know, the one who's on the road. Webna Sabil is a reference to the, the stranded traveler. And by stranded traveler, we mean that these are people, and this was very common in the past. That when people would travel, especially when they're traveling across deserts, they would be looted. So a lot of these people, when they would travel, they're like highway robbers, they would get robbed. And, you know, for example, their animals would be taken, their horses would be, would be stolen, their wealth would be taken, and they would be stranded. And they, they wouldn't have transportation to return home. They had no money for or food or anything so these are people who are desperate and 
And so the verse is saying that these people who are the, 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 the stranded travelers, the, the wayfarers who were, who were looted or, or they just run out of resources. You know, maybe they, they underestimated how much they needed for their journey. And Islam doesn't want to see people stranded in the middle of nowhere and unable to get back to their families. And therefore, the Sharia mandates that, uh, that these people, that the community should, uh, should come together, that they should be given a portion from, uh, from Baytul Mad, for example, or the believers who are, are well-to-do should, uh, should rescue someone who's, uh, who's in financial distress, who's in an, in an emergency situation either by just giving them gifts or charity or giving them uh, a loan, like I mentioned earlier. So that's the meaning of uh, Ibn Sadi, someone who is, is desperate because they've exhausted all of their wealth during their travels and they're unable to get back home or reach their destination. Or it could refer to someone who was looted, who was a victim of highway robbery and they don't have uh, the ability to, to get where they need to go or to return home. Now, in today's in today's world, it's very uncommon because you know we live in a global village. It's easy to kind of access your uh, you know your wealth, but in the past, it was a big problem. And it and it could be that in many parts of the world today, it might still be uh, an issue. But it's referring to people who are in desperate situations, travelers who who have who have lost everything and who don't have the means to return back to their homes and their families. Um, uh, a follow-up question, uh, sure. uh, Sheikh, about the same uh, ayah. Does it also mean about the people uh, who are working in the path of Allah uh, for the propagation of Islam, reaching out to people and um, other stuff? <clears throat> Usually, Ibn Sabil doesn't refer to someone who's working uh, in the way of God. So there, there's no mention of even the, uh, the person's creed. So this could be someone who doesn't even have the, our same belief system. So Ibn Sabil in the Arabic language, typically, I mean, I haven't seen that usage. I could be wrong, but based on my, uh, my research on, on this concept, it refers, uh, it refers to the, the stranded travel, traveler. Now, if, if there are hadith that, uh, that indicate otherwise, I, I haven't come across them. So Ibn Sabil, from my understanding and from just from the, uh, the, the usage of the word in the Quran and in, in hadith literature, it's, it's, it's speaking about a traveler and not necessarily someone who's, who's you know, uh, doing something peaceably in life. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Ahsantum, Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to spend some time reflecting on um, these verses of the Quran. Inshallah, if Allah gives us the tawfiq, we will continue our discussion next week. May Allah protect you, Imam Sahib al Zaman, alayhi salam, protect you and your family. And then we need more and more preachers like you, Sheikh. Inshallah, with your dua, please keep me in your prayers, and I look forward to seeing you guys, inshallah, soon. Inshallah,